All right, we're starting to see some people join in our webinar. So I'm going to uh, wait just a minute or two as our participants log in to the presentation. So if everyone can just stay tuned, we'll begin shortly. Recording in progress. Still see the participants signing in, so we'll wait just a little bit longer here before we begin. Didn't take long to get a question. No, we've already got one <laughs> pop up. That's great. Someone's just wishing us a good afternoon. Nice. <clears throat> and I'll wait about uh, one more minute and then we'll begin. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Gunther. I'm the director here at Falling Water and thank you all for signing in today for the webinar. Uh, we have a great audience. Looks like almost 200 people have joined us. So thank you very much for signing on for the first webinar of the 2024 season. Uh, and the purpose of this series is to expand knowledge about Falling Water uh, through a range of different topics that relate to art, design, architecture and nature. Um, and today we're going to learn about a very unique topic that we really have never explored in depth, and that's the geology of falling water. We're going to gain new understandings of uh, the local stone that Frank Lloyd Wright used uh, to build to build falling water. Um, and we're joined by our guest, uh, geologist Fred Zelt. Fred is a native of Western Pennsylvania. Um, and he started learning from rock outcrops at the age of 17. He went on to earn geology degrees at MIT and got his doctorate at Princeton and served for 30 years as a researcher, explorer, and manager with ExxonMobil, including assignments in Houston, Norway, England, and New Orleans. Um, when he retired, Fred returned to Western Pennsylvania and took up bicycling, pedaling across the United States, that's quite a feat, um, created STEM and cycling curriculum, created uh, Earth Science Excursions, LLC, and as a volunteer has led more than 70 geology themed hikes and bike rides. Uh, he also has YouTube videos, um, so make sure to check those out about the geology and landscape of Western Pennsylvania bike trails. And those YouTube videos have thousands of views. Uh, in 2023, Fred led the first comprehensive geologic study of falling water and published those results in the Geological Society of America Field Guide 66. So he's going to talk about the findings of that study with us today. Um, and if you have questions throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to try and answer those questions along the way, but we'll also do a Q&A once Fred um, wraps up with his presentation. Um, but Fred, I'll turn things over to you and thank you so much for joining us and sharing uh, this really unique knowledge with us today. Thanks, Justin. I'll uh, get things going with the screen share, uh, but I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to study falling water. Um, I've had lots of chances to discover, explore new areas, and this has been one of my favorites. So thank you very much. The objectives of this talk are to show falling water through the eyes of a geologist, provide a deeper understanding of Wright's organic architecture, and show the interplay between art and science in this important site. This is the first public presentation of new work, and I suspect that in an hour you'll see these familiar falling water scenes in a new way. I'd like to thank and acknowledge the contributions of colleagues Jim Shawless and Grant Walk, who I think are participating in this event as well as many people who provided key advice, information, and assistance over the past year. 
This work was conducted on a volunteer basis with no other funding. On this color map of elevation of the land, we see that falling water lies in an undulating upland plateau between the long narrow valleys and ridges of the Appalachian Mountains to the east and to the west, a low plateau direct dissected by rivers and streams. The landforms of the falling water area are part of a continent margin scale context. Falling water is nestled in a broad downward fold of rock layers between the upward folds of Chestnut Ridge and Laurel Hill. Like the Appalachians to the east, these long folds were formed during collision of the continental plates of Africa and North America about 300 million years ago. The great mountain belt that was formed to the east of falling water has now been worn down to its roots with exhumed folds from the tectonic compression reflected in the regional landscape. Rocks at the surface at falling water were deposited as sand, silt, clay, and peat about 310 million years ago. By about 270 million years ago, uh, they were buried by sediment and rock to a maximum depth of 12 to 13,000 feet. The sediment was cemented into hard rock at great depth, then brought back to the surface today after hundreds of millions of years of erosion and removal of younger layers. Let's now look at the rock exposed at the surface at Falling Water. On the left is a geologic map of the Falling Water area with a color overlay showing the locations of Pottsville Formation in blue and Allegheny Formation in green, superimposed on a shaded relief map of the surface of the land. The Allegheny River is on the left, west of Paradise Overlook. The lower gorge of Bear Run is in the middle of the map, including the location of the Falling Water House. On the right is a schematic representation of the stack of sedimentary rock layers that are at the surface in the falling water area. The vertical scale bar represents 10 meters or 33 feet. The upper Pottsville formation includes thick coarse sandstone shown in yellow on the vertical section called the Homewood sandstone. Hard quartz rich Homewood sandstone holds up the waterfalls at falling water, forms the bedrock beneath and beside the house and forms cliffs on the landscape, including below the quarry and below Paradise Overlook. The homewood also includes relatively thin layers of gray siltstone and clay rich shale that were deposited on the flat surfaces of filled abandoned sandy channels or the concave upward surfaces of temporarily unfilled channels. The homewood sandstone is overlain by fine grained falling water sandstones that were deposited in beach or tidal flat environments when the brackish or marine salt water of a shallow inland sea briefly inundated the area. This is the interval of the building stone and pavers at Falling Water, which were excavated in the quarry shown in the map. The Homewood and Falling Water sandstones are overlain and underlain by gray siltstone shales and black coals that are not resistant to erosion and don't form natural outcrops. In addition to the rock layers having an imprint on the shape of the land, bedrock layers affect the distribution of springs and flora at Falling Water. The Brookville coal layer shown at the top of the vertical section is a highly fractured natural conduit for groundwater that overlies a relatively impermeable clay rich shale. The fractured rock conduit with clay seal at the base likely forms a perched aquifer feeding natural springs on the edges of Lower Bear Run Gorge, including the spring water that flows into the pool at Falling Water. Rhododendron and other acidic soil loving plants uh, thrive on soils sourced from homewood sandstone, and rhododendron are an important and beloved part of the landscape in all seasons. So their occurrence has a geologic underpinning. You can see the uh, places where there are rhododendron and no rhododendron. Rhododendron on Pottsville formation and not soils based on Allegheny formation. And this can be seen from the bird's eye viewpoint. Homewood sandstone bedrock and thriving rhododendron are in the foreground and no green rhododendron are on the distant hillside where soils were sourced from Allegheny Formation bedrock. This relationship can also be seen at Paradise Overlook with abundant rhododendron on homewood sandstone and none higher on the landscape where there's Allegheny Formation derived soil. This relationship between flora, soil and bedrock is common throughout the region. This photo shows an excellent outcrop of thick homewood sandstone less than a mile west of the falling water quarry. The sedimentary layers are fairly flat lying in this outcrop, except near the base of the homewood on the left, where inclined layers reflect river channel erosion and fill. The homewood is underlain by gray siltstones and shales of the Mercer interval and overlain by horizontally layered falling water sandstone at the top of the cliff. We will look at the cliff top more closely on the next slide. This is the falling water building stone rock layer 
in the wild. On the left are two photos from the top of the cliff in the previous photo in a location named for a nearby bottle of wine, whitewater rapid in the Okagane River. There are thicker layers near the base and thinner layers near the top of the falling water sandstone interval. On the right are images from a very nice natural outcrop of falling water sandstone nearby. Sandstones can be exposed well in natural outcrops, but siltstones and shales are not. To see all of the rock layers, we will look at the falling water sandstone interval and rock samples that were collected deep underground. In this slide, we see a two inch diameter column of rock called a core that was collected hundreds of feet underground in a well drilled by the Pennsylvania Geological Survey in Ohio Pile State Park, two and a half miles from falling water. The numbers indicate depth and feet of the rock layers in the well, and the top of the interval is on the upper left. The lightest layers are sandstones and the darker layers are siltstones and shales. As the generalized vertical column and rock photos show, the Homewood sandstone is overlain by the falling water sandstone interval, which includes sandstone, siltstones, and shales. The falling water sandstones were deposited about 310 million years ago by water currents, such as during storms or strong tidal flows, and the siltstones and shales were deposited in fair weather or slack water between storms or strong currents. Frank Lloyd Wright instructed workers to take the sandstone layers as they came in the quarry and it's very special that the bases and tops of the natural sandstone layers are preserved in the building stone and pavers of falling water. The layers of softer siltstone and shale between the harder falling water sandstones enable the natural sandstone layer tops and bottoms to be preserved during quarrying. A close-up of one of the rock samples shows very fine layering that can occur in the falling water sandstone interval. My colleague Grant Walk, an expert in tidal deposits, recognizes well-ordered layers or bundles that may reflect high and low current flows of neap and spring tides. Wright ensured that some of the sandstone slabs extend farther out from the mortar, Wright called these stickouts. The stickouts are present on exterior and most interior walls and the bridge piers. Because the wall stones were all sourced from a six foot thick interval in the quarry, the fresh stone all has similar, is similar in color, generally light gray. This causes the stickouts to have a special aesthetic function. The pattern of stonework is visible from a distance only because of shadows under the stickouts. To my geologist's eyes, the pattern of stonework at falling water is very pleasing and natural, consistent with an organic theme. These black and white photos from the falling water archive show quarrying in progress. There are both sandstone blocks and slabs visible. Wright instructed that thin slabs of sandstone with relatively smooth surfaces be set aside during quarrying for use as floor, terrace, and walkway pavers. Such set-aside slabs are visible in the top photo. The contours of the quarry landscape are visible in the recent color photo on the lower right and the adjacent black and white image. This historic photo shows thin sandstone slabs staged and ready to be laid on the bridge. Here we see falling water builder Walter Hall and son Raymond V. Hall posing with slabs staged to be laid beside the falling water pool. On walls in the background, the aesthetic function of stickouts is very clear. Let's start looking in more detail at the natural arrangement of rock layers at falling water. This map shows the path of a cross section of the rock layers. Sites where outcrops were observed and measured or indicated and the star is at the falling water house. The cross section extends from north to southeast. The cross section was drawn to indicate ancient features of erosion and deposition of the sedimentary rock layers, focusing on the Mercer interval, the Homewood sandstone, and the falling water sandstone at the top. The interval of falling water sandstone that was removed at the quarry is highlighted. Abundant river channels in the Homewood are shown schematically. They may include deltaic distributary river channels. The next slides will show this part of the Homewood sandstone at the house, including a flat-lying shale and a younger channel. Rivers and streams can form waterfalls where erosion working its way upstream encounters a hard layer such as the sandstone lip of the upper waterfall overlying a softer layer that forms a plunge pool at the base of the waterfall. At falling water, the inset photos show the gray shale layer that forms the softer layer of the plunge pool at the base of the upper waterfall. This gray shale stained orange with iron oxide forms a flat layer that probably represents a period when an ancient filled sandy river channel was abandoned. 
The shale of the plunge pool is exposed to the right of the waterfall, but to the left, it's covered by sandstone boulders. Another prominent feature of this view is the concave up or smile-shaped recess in the middle of the upper waterfall. Let's look more closely at similar features, then come back to the waterfall. In the next series of slides, we will observe a common motif among four outcrops of Homewood sandstone that are seen by many falling water visitors, starting along the path between the visitor center and meadow and continuing in a counterclockwise direction. Sandstone layers in the outcrop next to the path show scour and fill near the base, capped by a more even layer with sedimentary structures called cross lamination, deposited in a river as a small underwater sand dune, sand wave, or sandbar. The prominent outcrop next to Bear Run at the bottom of the meadow has the same pattern, with the smile shape of a preserved channel in the rock that was initially filled with silty sandstone, then completely filled with more quartz-rich sandstone, followed by a subaqueous sand wave. The dark recess or rock underhang I call the cave is at the base of the cliff left of center in the photo. The recess occurs where relatively soft silty sandstone, siltstones and shales were removed. One can imagine Pleistocene megafauna such as cave bears or giant ground sloths using the rock underhang. Perhaps the, the Southwest facing refuge adjacent to stream and flat terrace of the meadow also served people in the past. With a view of natural shelter, water, and woodland, this lovely spot along Bear Run is a good place to pause and reflect. People have been in southwestern Pennsylvania for nearly a thousand generations since before glaciers retreated from the state. Names given to these people include the Adena and Hopewell cultures, the Monongahela people, several tribes including the Delaware, Shawnee, and Seneca, and the French, English, and American nations. Western Pennsylvania lands and skies have provided sustenance for all of these people and have also been a source of mystery, wonder, and beauty across the generations. We honor those who've come before us and recognize that their descendants are living among us in North America. We recognize our role in responsible stewardship of the land, which will be here long after our generation has passed. I wrote this land acknowledgement two years ago before leading a series of excursions in Western Pennsylvania the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy is currently working to develop uh, land acknowledgement. Let's continue our journey to better understand and appreciate the land. Next to the driveway at the house, the scour of an interpreted ancient river channel occurs near the base of the upper Homewood sandstone outcrop with sandstone fill and a subaqueous sand wave across the top. Farther down the, in the Homewood sandstone, behind the upper waterfall, there's a similar pattern. As at the cave, the recessive underhang reflects an erosional channel that was partly filled with silty sand, followed by more quartz-rich, harder sandstone. The curved shape reflects the base of a channel. In the bushes to the right, close examination shows that the recessive interval disappears under an erosional surface and is replaced by hard, river-deposited sandstone layers. From the iconic view, one can see the smile shape of the ancient river channel behind the upper waterfall and the flat top of the lower waterfall, which reflects abandonment of a sand-filled channel. The location of falling water is a red dot on the terrain map of continents about 310 million years ago on the left. Rivers brought sand to falling water from the growing mountain belt to the southeast and south. As the detailed map on the right shows, there was a shallow interior sea to the west. Falling water was near the equator, but below the map to the south, there were ice sheets, glacial ice sheets, sheets near the pole. Glacial, interglacial climate and sea level cycles caused the interior, interior sea to flood into the falling water area at times. The falling water sandstone was deposited when seawater flooded over the older river deposits with beaches or tidal flats reworking older quartz rich river sands. These natural outcrops show the thin sandstone beds typical of the upper falling water sandstone. Wavy layering of the sandstones preserves ripple marks that were created by waves and water currents when the sand was deposited 310 million years ago. The top view of a house terrace paver and close-ups of the sides of wall stones here show a few of the many examples of ripple marks at falling water. The side views indicate that falling water sandstone ripple marks were formed by waves, currents, and combinations of waves and currents. There are many hundreds of such specimens at falling water, a feature of the organic design and a delight for geologists. For an example from the modern day, these photos show fine-grained sand at low tide in the intertidal zone of a beach 
on the northern end of Tybee Island, Georgia, USA, near the new Tybee Island Marine Science Center. The linear sand ripples typically were created by wave action. Wave ripples generally also have symmetrical crests, and in cross-section, the laminations have a characteristic wavy or symmetrical pattern. Flat tops of the sand ripples on the right were caused by drop of the water level at low tide. Here are very different ripples exposed in the intertidal zone at low tide on an ebb tidal delta next to the inlet at the south end of Tybee Island. The crests of these current ripples are very irregular and the ripples are very asymmetrical in top view and in cross section. The ripples were deposited by the ebb tidal current which was directed seaward away from the viewer. Back to pavers at falling water. The straight crested symmetrical ripple marks probably were shaped by wave action in shallow water. There are complex patterns of current and combined flow ripple marks, which can be produced by wave driven currents. The use of coatings to enhance the natural character and wet appearance of the falling water living room floor is well known. Ripple marks on the floor contribute to the multi sensory experience of water and flow in the living room. Traces of life are also abundant in the intertidal zone of Tybee Island. These photos show burrows of ghost shrimp on a beach and polychaetes on the margin of a tidal inlet. Here's a paving stone near the main entrance of the house. Vertical burrows and flat crested linear ripple marks are consistent with the sandstone having been deposited in an intertidal setting 310 million years ago. Perhaps less obvious, we observe that some of the burrows seem to be paired. Here's a better example of paired burrows on a paver on Edgar Sr.'s terrace. Each pair probably is part of a U-shaped dwelling burrow of a filter feeder called Arenicolides. <laughs> the larger circle is the entrance and the smaller is the exit. A modern example of such a filter feeder is the bloodworm. The fossil traces of life we've observed at falling water and in nearby outcrops are shown in bolder text on this schematic profile of coastal marine environments. The study of traces of living things is called ichnology. The trace fossils at falling water are consistent with Scolithos and Cruziana ichnofaces, and environments from intertidal to shallow marine. Traces include dwelling burrows of the intertidal zone and shallow shore face shown in red, including straight conical and U-shaped burrows. Branching networks of burrows within the sand shown in red and blue are also found at falling water. Double-tracked horizontal grazing traces shown in blue on top of the sediment in the shore face environment occur in falling water building stone too. The natural sandstone art object above the fireplace in Edgar Jr.'s third, third floor study has very special color and texture. The original horizontal layering of this sandstone slab was set vertically to display red iron oxide mineralization and a texture that reflects burrows of living things branching thalassinoides burrows and circular sections of vertical burrows, which were probably formed by ancient arthropods. Some of the trace fossils are very fine, delicate features. The paver in the upper left and wall stones of the other photos show a few of the many traces of life at falling water. One of my favorites is the symmetrical wavy trace with abrupt ends on paver A in the upper left. A similar specimen is harder to see, but present on the top of a wall stone stick out in B. This sort of trace can be created by the swishing tail of a swimming fish, where the tail briefly brushed the sediment. E and F include the fine double-tracked horizontal trace that was highlighted on the schematic profile. Stickouts provide views of the tops and sides of small burrows. There's even a tiny U-shaped burrow in B. These outcrop photos show thin beds of the falling water sandstone interval less than a mile from the falling water quarry. Small vertical and horizontal traces are visible in B and C, and D shows a tiny burrow that had a lining. Here's another natural feature of sandstones at falling water, but this feature was not created by sea life. The outcrop on the left and paver on Lothian's terrace on the right have cracks that form soon after deposition of the sand due to shrinkage of the overlying layer of sediment. The shrinkage probably was caused by a difference in salinity of water in and above the soft sediment, consistent with variations in water salinity near a shoreline. These are often called cineresis cracks. Many visitors admire the intricate rough surfaces of coping stones atop walls outside the guest suite. This texture was created by pressure solution of the quartz-rich sandstone when it was buried miles deep 
and probably over a period of millions of years. The intricate shape of stylolites can be seen in the upper left in an example from an upper Pottsville outcrop on falling water grounds. Hiding in plain sight above eye level on the wall leading to the house main entrance is one block of coarse grained quartz rich sandstone identical to Homewood sandstone at falling water. The coarse grained sandstone block was set with original layering vertical parallel to the wall. Placement of this geologic beauty mark or hallmark stone must have been intentional. An important part of falling water organic design is large boulders that were preserved and built into the house, two of which are shown in the as-built plan of the first floor. We will look at the boulder in the living room, the tilted boulder, and a boulder in the foundation area below the map level. But before we leave this map, please note the north arrow on the lower right, the parallel orientations of house and stream, and the roughly east-west orientation of the upper waterfall, which is oblique to the trend of the stream. We will discuss these aspects of the organic design shortly. Wright designed the house around this boulder, the top of which is exposed in a very special place, the hearth in front of the living room fireplace. The massive nature of the exposed rock is consistent with the Homewood sandstone bedrock source of the boulder. The lower left photo shows boulders incorporated into the foundation of the house beside Bear Run and very rough stonework transitioning to the typical stone of falling water walls. The other photos show interior and exterior views of the large boulder beside the driveway. The originally horizontal sedimentary layers tilted toward Bear Run when the boulder detached from bedrock. In the foreground of the exterior view is a flat sandstone surface with a diamond pattern of leaf scars on the bark of a large fossil tree, a lepidodendron. Stepping back, let's look at forces that shape the landscape features right used in the organic design of falling water. The bold lines on this elevation map show the three river systems that are interpreted to have drained Western Pennsylvania before Pleistocene glaciations started 2.6 million years ago. The ancient rivers are thought to have drained to the north as indicated by the arrowheads. This includes the generally northwesterly flow of the Yakagani River near Falling Water. Between 2.6 million and 14,000 years ago, ancient ice sheets periodically extended from Canada into northwestern Pennsylvania and adjacent Ohio and New York. The ice blocked the north flowing rivers, forcing the river systems in front of the ice to amalgamate and flow to the southwest. This map shows the resulting present day drainage system of western Pennsylvania. As the arrowhead on the lower left indicates, the amalgamated river system flows to the southwest into the Ohio River Valley of Kentucky and Ohio. In the southern Ohio and, and Kentucky area, the ancient river was at a much lower elevation than the pre-glacial river system of western Pennsylvania. Pleistocene reorganization of the rivers caused erosion to work its way up into Western Pennsylvania rivers and tributaries. One or more waves of erosion are still working their way up tributaries today. Reorganization of the river system caused the Okagani River and tributaries, including Bear Run, to incise deeper into the landscape. To more clearly understand the special landscape of falling water, it's helpful to be able to identify evidence for erosional pulses in stream valleys. Rivers and streams tend to have an equilibrium profile shown on this side view of the elevation of a stream or river bottom from a steep part of the stream in an upland area on the right to a flatter reach on the left as the stream approaches base level of the sea, a lake, or a larger river. When the base level drops, as happened when the western Pennsylvania river systems connected with rivers at lower elevations in the southern Ohio and Kentucky area during glacial times, a pulse of erosion starts working its way upstream as the stream tries to establish a new equilibrium profile that fits the lower base level. Through time, the pulse of erosion continues upstream. The frontier of the accelerated erosion manifests through a convex upward shape and the otherwise concave up elevation profile. Along the old elevation profile, shown as a dashed line, the new and size stream can be flanked by terraces that are remnants of the floor of the old stream valley. If there are multiple drops in base level, then multiple waves of erosion, each with a convex upward elevation profile, can proceed upstream simultaneously, and multiple abandoned terraces can be left high and dry beside the incised stream. This chart shows global temperature for the last 5 million years based on an oxygen isotope proxy for temperature preserved in small marine fossils. Cold intervals are at the bottom and hot at the top. Although there are glaciers today in Greenland and Antarctica, Thick ice does not cover most of Canada as happened during peak glaciations. We're currently in an interglacial period that started almost 
12,000 years ago. As the climate chart shows, since the start of Pleistocene glaciations about 2.6 million years ago, there have been many glacial interglacial cycles. It's not well known how long ago glaciers first extended far enough south to block the old north draining river systems in Western Pennsylvania, but recent evidence suggests that the rivers could have been affected by glaciers as early as 1.8 million years ago. Pleistocene evolution of the river system could have occurred through multiple glacial cycles, with multiple pulses of erosion being introduced to the Okegeni River system in Bear Run. This chart also shows that two glacial cycles have occurred in the last 240,000 years, a time period we will revisit when we discuss rate of erosion and upstream retreat of waterfalls. We will now focus on the landscape of the falling water area nestled between the large ancient folds of Chestnut Ridge and Laurel Hill. The yellow box shows the outline of the next series of maps. This color elevation map shows Yakagani Gorge, where the river cuts through Laurel Hill and Chestnut Ridge from confluence where the Yakagani River is joined by the Castleman River and Laurel Hill Creek, downstream through the gorge to Connellsville. Waterfalls we will discuss are Ohio Pile Falls of the Yakagani River and waterfalls on two tributaries of the Yak, Cucumber Falls on Cucumber Run and the waterfalls at Falling Water on Bear Run. The watersheds of Bear Run and Cucumber Run are very similar in size. The streams have similar flow volumes and both have waterfalls with lips held up by Homewood Sandstone. Geologists at Lehigh University have studied rates of erosion in the Ohio Pile area and estimate that over the last 240,000 years, Cucumber Falls may have migrated upstream at an average rate of 0.7 millimeters per year, which is the width of a typical pencil lead. The long-term average rate at falling water could have been similar. We will look more closely at the waterfalls and bear run on the next slides in the area outlined in turquoise. Waterfalls are erosional features that migrate upstream. As the Lehigh researchers showed, the pulse of erosion reflected by Ohio Pile Falls would have migrated past the mouth of Cucumber Run, perhaps about 240,000 years ago, launching Cucumber Falls on an upstream journey up Cucumber Run. The same pulse of deepening of Yakagani Gorge would have passed by the mouth of Bear Run hundreds of thousands of years earlier launching a pulse of erosion and gorge deepening up Bear Run. The pulse of erosion has had more time to work its way upstream on Bear Run than on Cucumber Run. On the map, we can see that the waterfalls at Falling Water are farther from the Yakagani River than is Cucumber Falls. Lower Bear Run can be thought of as a more mature version of Lower Cucumber Run. And Lower Cucumber Run can be an analog for Lower Bear Run hundreds of thousands of years ago. In the upper left are, an elevation, are elevation profiles of a segment of the Okagani River and Bear Run. Ohio Pile Falls is at D on the map and profile. The Bear Run profile has two clear convex, convex upward segments that may reflect two pulses of erosion. One occurs where Homewood Sandstone Bedrock is exposed in the stream bed at the meadow and falling water waterfalls. And the other occurs farther upstream where fractured reddish brown bedrock of an older sandstone layer is exposed in the stream bed. Away from these areas, the stream bottom is covered with sand, cobbles, and boulders. Next, we will focus on the immediate falling water area shown in the red boxes. This is a shaded elevation re relief map. The lower gorge of Bear Run is geologically young with steep sides. The head of the lower gorge occurs adjacent to the meadow at falling water at the top of the convex upward zone of more rapid erosion on the elevation profile. Flat terraces at the Meadow and Visitor Center may be ancient remnants of an older, higher levels of Bear Run. The falling water waterfalls are part of the convex upward zone of erosion. By analogy with Cucumber Falls, the waterfalls may be migrating upstream at a long-term average pace of the width of a pencil lead per year, averaged across two glacial interglacial cycles. The long-term average rate is not necessarily accurate for the current interglacial climate regime. Stream flow, freeze-thaw cycling and waterfall retreat rate may have been much greater during past climate regimes, such as transitions between glacial and interglacial periods. Historic photos of the Ohio Pile, Bear Run, Cucumber Run, and other southwestern Pennsylvania waterfalls held up by hard Homewood sandstone show no obvious changes in the last 100 to 120 years. Boulders at the bases of the waterfalls and studies of waterfall retreat elsewhere suggest that periodic rock falls may be more important contributors to upstream waterfall migration than slow year-by-year -year erosion. The analogy between cucumber and bear runs 
yielded an interesting comparison relevant to falling water architectural design. The dashed line shows one possible scenario of the elevation profile of Bear Run about 400,000 years ago. The geometry of bedrock layers suggests that long ago, a waterfall on Bear Run could have been very similar to Cucumber Falls today, with fine-grained Mercer rocks forming a plunge pool beneath a lip of Homewood sandstone. Like Cucumber Falls today, the waterfall on Bear Run 400,000 years ago could have been a single 36 foot tall waterfall versus the two waterfalls at Falling Water today, which combined uh, to be 33 feet tall. The lip of Cucumber Falls is held up by quartz rich Homewood sandstone and the plunge pool at the base has gray siltstone shales and black coal of the Mercer zone. In the recess of brown silty sandstones between the Homewood and Mercer, there are curved erosional surfaces of ancient channels similar in shape and size to the prominent channel recess behind the upper waterfall at Falling Water. What if Bear Run today was at an earlier stage of development similar to Cucumber Run? What would Falling Water look like if it were built on a single 30-foot, six-foot tall waterfall like Cucumber Falls? Here's such a comparison. Falling Water in its natural organic landscape versus the thought experiment of the Falling Water House on Cucumber Falls. This thought experiment immediately illustrates how well falling water or organic design fits the actual landscape. The spacing of house stories reflects spacing of river deposited sandstone layers exposed in the falling water waterfalls and less so the terrain of cucumber falls. Falling water house terraces step back away from the viewer organically echoing the waterfall steps. The step back of the balconies does not fit the geometry of cucumber falls. This exercise rooted in natural history of the landscape helped me gain new conscious appreciation of these key features of organic design at Falling Water and their fit with the terrain. Turning to plan view, this illustration shows that the orientation of Bear Run and Falling Water fit with a tectonic grain of the Allegheny folding of rock layers due to continents colliding hundreds of millions of years ago. We will look at fit of the house into the tectonic grain more closely. First, it's helpful to see the sorts of rock natural fractures that have been found to be associated with compression and folding of stiff rock layers deep underground. There can be an orthogonal fracture set with fractures nearly at right angles shown in blue and conjugate fractures at an acute angle shown in red. The orthogonal and conjugate fracture sets may not both be well developed in a rock layer. This now familiar terrain map shows the relationship between orthogonal fold parallel and cross fold natural fracture orientations and the tectonic folds that are reflected by the shape of the land. Next, we will look at maps of the Okagani River in the Ohio Pile and Reservoir areas. For many years, geologists have observed that straight reaches of streams and rivers in the erosional landscape of this region can parallel ancient bedrock fracture sets with the fractures forming zones of weakness that downcoming cutting streams follow. Here are excellent examples of this with segments of the river following orthogonal fold parallel and cross fold fracture orientations. In the next slide, we'll go to river level at entrance rapid and view prominent cross fold fractures parallel to the river. The vertical planar surfaces of the outcrop are cross fold natural fractures. This reach of the Okagani River from entrance rapid in the foreground to the mouth of Cucumber Run in the distance parallels this fracture set and is thought by many geologists to have been controlled by it. Turning to the grounds at Falling Water, first we will look at natural fractures in Homewood Sandstone Bedrock in the lower meadow area in the red circle on the map. When floods scour and expose bedrock along Bear Run, this outcrop exhibits both orthogonal and conjugate natural fractures shown in blue and red. The compass azimuth of orthogonal fold parallel fractures is about 40 degrees here, parallel to the large folds and tectonic grain we saw on the regional map. Next, we will turn to the house and adjacent Bear Run. This is a view from the bridge looking down Bear Run. The house and this reach of Bear Run are parallel. On the left, a closer view of the bedrock ledge at the top of the upper waterfall shows long straight natural fractures parallel to this reach of Bear Run and the house. On the right, we see the sawtooth nature of the lip of the upper waterfall. This is a top view of Bedrock and Bear Run and the lip of the upper waterfall looking down from the edge of the east terrace. The inset photo shows a prominent notch in the waterfall lip. The edge of the house and shadow of the house are visible near the bottom of the photo. The sides of the house have azimuths of about 53 degrees and 323 degrees relative to true north. The orthogonal fracture set shown in blue 
dominates bedrock of the ledge holding up the upper waterfall. The circle shows a summary of the measured fracture orientations with north toward the lower left. The waterfall lip is oriented oblique to the best developed fractures with details of the sawtooth pattern being defined by natural fractures. Ohio Pile Falls, American Falls of the Niagara River and some other waterfalls with well-developed orthogonal fracture sets also have waterfall lip orientations oblique to the orthogonal fractures. In contrast, the sandstone ledge holding up the lower waterfall is more layered and the conjugate fracture set is better developed there. The photo and oriented fracture summary plot on the right show that the lip of the lower waterfall is oriented subparallel to well-developed conjugate fractures. The different orientations of the two waterfalls at Falling Water are part of the charm of the iconic view, and the orientations may be due to different development of ancient tectonic fractures in the two sandstone ledges. Falling Water buildings are oriented near Wright's preferred northeast-southwest house orientation, which allowed sunlight to fall on each exterior wall in morning, at midday, or afternoon during much of the year. Part of the magic of falling water is that Wright's preferred organic house orientation fit the orientation of Bear Run at the waterfalls, which was influenced by an imprint of ancient tectonic forces in the bedrock. As a geologist, this is a very special scene to me. On a sunny March day last year, the edges of the prominent notch in the lip of the upper waterfall were concordant with a notch in the shadow of the house. I felt chills as I realized this concordance showed perfect harmony between the house orientation right preferred and the ancient tectonic grain of the bedrock and landscape. I don't think Wright planned the concordance of the shadow with the notch, but this small scene has deep meaning nonetheless. In the last section of the talk, I would like to illuminate the many special characteristics of right organic design rel relevant to geology and the landscape by sharing observations from falling water and other stone houses designed or influenced by Wright. Lynn Hall in Northern Pennsylvania was built by Walter Hall, the builder of falling water. Hall greatly admired Wright and the general design of Lynn Hall is thought to have been influenced by Wright's Darwin Martin House, 100 miles north in Buffalo. The core and main entrance of Lynn Hall on the right were built largely before Hall was engaged as builder at Falling Water. The addition to the left was built after Hall had been more directly influenced by Wright. Comparison of details in stonework at Lynn Hall helped me better understand details of organic design at Falling Water. For example, the exterior of the core at Lynn Hall does not have stickouts. Instead, color and tone of contrast between olive gray sandstone slabs from flagstone quarries behind Lynn Hall and light salmon sandstone blocks quarried elsewhere were enough to enable the pattern of stonework to be visible from a distance. In addition, the addition and the guest cottage at Lynn Hall were built after water, Walter Hall had worked at Falling Water, and their stone exteriors have both color contrast and stickouts. Comparison of Lynn Hall stonework with Falling Water highlights the aesthetic function of the stickouts at Falling Water, where the building stone lacked contrasting colors. I might mention that the olive gray sandstone slabs quarried behind and built into Lynn Hall are a typical flagstone with abundant parting lineation and very few burrows or ripple marks. In the quarries, the flagstone occurs in natural layers several feet thick that were split to the desired thickness by workers, split into flagstone slabs. To a geologist, the split flagstone is a very different material than the natural sandstone layers with preserved tops and bases at Falling Water. Out of hundreds of stone pavers at Lynn Hall, this is one of only a few with burrows. It was set in a location all visitors would have seen, the steps leading to the main entrance. The next three slides are a work in progress created to highlight elements of organic architecture relative to geology at Falling Water. 28 elements were identified, 18 are aspects of the stone and 10 are relevant to the landscape setting. Elements contributing to organic design common to stone right houses include whether the stone walls have a variety, wall stones have a variety of sizes and shapes, whether facings and edges were chopped versus sawn, whether there are wall stone stickouts or contrasting colors, whether stickouts or contrasting wall stones extend into exterior and interior corners, whether natural rock boundaries and special natural features were preserved, whether walls are solid stone versus a stone facade, whether there's a hallmark stone or right tile, use of at least one stone art object, such as the petroglyphs at Taliesin West, and irregular versus rectangular paver edges. 
Landscape re related organic design elements include fit of the house into the natural landscape and the relationship between the house and key natural features, such as a waterfall, lake, ocean, or mountain. Whether the plan orientation of the house fits Wright's ideal orientation or takes advantage of morning solar warming. Windows arranged and designed to permit exceptional views of nature, including seeing a key natural feature through the house, such as seeing Lake Erie through the middle of Greycliff House. Use of shadows and sunbeams, water features on the grounds or built into the house, whether the water feature is sourced by a natural spring or stream, and use of natural sound or breezes. These lists are akin to a birder's list or a naturalist's list of flora. Lists encourage observation and they provide us an excuse to explore beautiful new areas. The 28 elements seem to be design features Wright used intentionally because they're present in his own test bed stone buildings at Taliesin and Taliesin West. The dark red boxes show where the 28 elements of organic architecture are present in a sampling of the more than 30 stone houses Wright designed or at the bottom of the table in stone houses that were influenced by Wright and falling water. Light red indicates that the element is partially present. There are question marks on some of the more subtle elements in buildings I haven't been able to visit or observe adequately in photos. Taliesin and Taliesin West are in the top two rows. The only two elements, only two elements seem to be missing from Taliesin West, one being a natural spring or stream source for the outdoor water feature in the Arizona desert. The full architect's palette of 28 organic design elements is present at Falling Water. There are very beautiful houses throughout the chart and the list of design features is meant to help develop understanding and appreciation for right structures, not reduce these artworks to a spreadsheet. I think study of the chronology of use of these design elements by Wright could yield, yield significant insights. Hopefully you now see many aspects of falling water in a new and special way with renewed appreciation of the interplay between art and science in this very special place. As seen by the, from the iconic view by a geologist, falling water is built of well-layered fine-grained shoreline sandstone full of traces of life and shifting water currents resting on the coarse-grained sandstone bedrock of a river system. Stickouts make falling water an excellent geological archive, and shadows of stickouts permit the natural pattern of stonework to be visible at a distance. The accord between Wright's preferred organic house orientation with a landscape shaped by the erosional signal of distant Pleistocene glaciers and tectonic imprint of an ancient mountain building episode is part of the magic of falling water. Orientations and spacing of the waterfalls are also in harmony with the organic design and beauty of falling water. Falling water is a masterpiece of harmony between art and landscape with science in a supporting role. This is the, the talk I'd uh, plan to deliver. Um, Justin encouraged me to um, cover a few of the slides I had in backup, uh, just so that we are sure to see those uh, before we hit Q&A. So let me uh, pass on to those. I want to show you some resources for uh, further learning. Uh, Justin mentioned that there's a falling water chapter in the 2023 Geological Society of America Field Guide 66. You can find it online, um, both as PDF and uh, in paper. There's also a chapter about special features in Ohio St Pile State Park near falling water. I uh, talked about the Georgia coast and there's a great uh, book for public consumption by Anthony Martin that shows life traces on the Georgia coast. Then there are four YouTube videos I wanted to recommend. The one that's shown in white here was made by Charles Beer, who recently retired from the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. It's really good in showing the relationship between geology and uh, living things and the flora in different regions of Pennsylvania. So it shows biogeography. The other three are um, YouTube videos uh, I've put out there uh, for a, a 20, 20, 22 and 22 series of bike excursions I led. Um, the one about Pleistocene river erosion is the one that focuses on the Allegheny and Ohio River Valley. So if you want more background about the timing of incision, the evidence for incision, terraces left behind uh, in this region, in the Pleistocene, that's a place uh, to look. The Laurel Highlands one talks about uh, the relationship between the shape of the land and land use and the bedrock layers. And you can get more background on the paleoclimate part, the natural history of climate, in the glacial edition talk, 
um, that talks a lot about the climate cycles, why there were cycles, um, how we're confident about the ups and downs of climate uh, during the time period I showed, those stable oxygen isotopes. Um, we have planned an in-person experience um, and uh, announced it a couple of weeks ago, um, planned it for October when the leaves are changing. Unfortunately, in a way, it's fully subscribed. But if there's interest, maybe in, in a future year, we could uh, maybe we'll repeat it next year. So those are the those are the slides I had planned to show. Let me stop sharing and we can go to Q&A. Thank you so much, Fred. Uh, fascinating. Um, I love what you said about falling water being art and nature with science in a supporting role. What a elegant way to express, express the house. Um, and you've given us a completely new way to see and understand falling water, not just the house, but the entire landscape uh, that surrounds us. So thank you for opening our eyes. Um, a question that has popped up several times in the Q&A. And as uh, attendees, if you have questions, please type them, type them in the Q&A and I'll try and field as many as we can uh, in, in the session for the rest of the session. But a question that kept popping up, um, and of course, one that always worries me, <laughs> is the erosion underneath the falls. Um, is that something that we need to worry about for the long-term preservation of falling water? and not just the erosion underneath the falls, but erosion of rock even upstream and along the falls? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I tried to talk about that a bit in the presentation. Um, you know, to a geologist, we look at really long time frames, right? And uh, a good thing to do would be to compare historic photos with the lip of the waterfall. And I think if you do that, you'll see that if, if there's any change, it's gotta be very minor. And that's what I've seen at Cucumber Falls, um, there's a waterfall in Beaver County that has home, a Homewood sandstone lip. Even Ohio Pile Falls with a tremendous volume of water there, when you compare it with historic photos, it really hasn't changed much. The waterfalls that have changed a lot during our lifetimes are Niagara Falls, which has a dolostone cap. Dolostone dissolves in water, in, in surface waters. So that is eroding back at a tremendous rate, not only because of the volume of water going across it, but it has a different lip. There's Robinson Falls near Connellsville. It has, um, it, it has eroded back tens of feet in the last 200 years, but it also has a limestone and dolostone cap. So that's one thing to look at there. Um, another, we talked about monitoring uh, in years when there's a good flood that scours the bedrock and you can closely examine it for fractures. That would be a, a good thing to do. Um, there are places in other landscapes where you can see a fracture that's parallel to the edge of a cliff and it's formed by extension because the cliff edge is about to, um, you know, it's getting ready to uh, descend. And actually there are fractures like that at Ohio Pile Falls. I mentioned there's an orthogonal fracture set there, just like the upper waterfall, it has the same orthogonal fracture set and it's an east-west waterfall, just like the upper waterfall. But there's also an east-west fracture orientation that's only near the waterfall. And I think it's because of that sort of extension. The waterfall at, at, at uh, Falling Water, um, the, uh, you know, the underhang in the middle of it, it's, it's got bolsters on both sides. It's got solid rock on both sides. It's not a very big feature. The plunge pool at the bottom, I mentioned it's armored by boulders on the left side as you're facing the waterfall from the iconic view that protect that shale. The shale is exposed on the right side, but it's probably been exposed for a very long time. So there's a, a, a you know, it, there are a lot of studies that could be done. The work we've done is uh, leave no trace, take no samples, do no lab analysis kind of study. And there are studies that you can do to estimate how long bedrock has been exposed. And a survey like that on Bear Run would have, I think, great scientific interest and maybe some practical interest too. Um, Fred, do you know what understanding Frank Lloyd Wright had of geology? I, I certainly don't know the answer to that question. I've never... I, I never thought this might be that. a question that would come up. Yeah. So uh, I actually uh, got permission, thanks thanks to the Avery folks. Come on here. There we go. Uh, I have a slide in the backup uh, that really helps think about that, because I've thought about that. So I thought it was natural for others to think about it. 
in this venue too. And it's a very familiar scene. I think probably all of you have seen this, right? It's the Time Magazine. Oh, what happened? Where did it go? Oh, it's, it's here. There it is. There it is. So I think probably all Frank Lloyd Wright fans have seen this. And to me, this was drawn in the studio in Wisconsin, right? They weren't on site and in open air drawing this. So this would have features that were important to Wright and folks there. The architecture of the house looks basically the same, right? It was pretty much built as is in the drawing. The lip of the waterfall has no notches. It's drawn with a straight edge. And we know that he used that as the baseline of his T-square with his 30, 60, 90 triangle. So there it is, you know, a, a draftsman waterfall, <laughs> but not a geologist's waterfall. And there's no smile in the waterfall, right? So that wasn't an important feature to him, I would suggest. Look at the boulders below it. Those aren't the rock layers that are there. You know, that's just artistic. To me, it looks like the trees at the top. You see the shape of the trees at the top? the shape of the boulders at the bottom. The boulders don't even have that shape. They typically have, uh, unless they've rolled down a river or a stream and get rounded, the boulders here typically have uh, flat sides because they're natural fractures and bedding planes. So that part of it wasn't drawn by a geologist. It's, a, it's an artistic rendering of a concept. And I might mention the same thing about stone walls. You know, When I look at stone walls, I look at stone walls a lot differently now than I did a year ago. And some stone walls, I mean, they're all artistic, just like a painting isn't a photograph. A stone wall is an artistic rendering to get a concept across. And some stone walls, they really give me the feel of an outcrop, a natural outcrop. And some, some stone walls look like nothing found in nature, <laughs> but they're still artistic, right? I mean, they're impressionistic paintings, they're oil paintings, they're all sorts of um, canvases that can be created for the same scene. So just another kind of uh, set of thoughts from a geologist about stonework too. Great. Um, this is from Carol. Um, in 1835 in Point Breeze, Judge Wilkins created a house uh, that was named Homewood. The nearby cemetery has the same name and there's a neighborhood that is called Homewood in Pittsburgh. Is there a relationship between uh, the names of these places and the geology that they're a part of. It's true that um, rock units tend to be named for places where there's a really prominent surface exposure of them and an outcrop. And actually this Homewood Sandstone is named for the little village along the railroad line in Beaver County, Northern Beaver County. Um, there's a waterfall there. It's a great place. It's one of at least five Buttermilk Falls in Pennsylvania, Buttermilk Falls Recreation Area. But that's the location uh, where the Homewood Sandstone was named. It's actually in detail, probably a different age than the Homewood sandstone layer in Ohio pile. Geologists figured out that out several years ago, but still it's a hard cliff forming sandstone layer in the upper part of the Pottsville. So that's how it got that, that name was from that village. But that's a really insightful question. Yeah, and people is. have asked me about Pottsville itself. And that's named for the type locality near Pottsville, Pennsylvania, the home of Yingling. <laughs> What about earthquakes and the orientation of the stresses in the stone? Any risk to falling water that way? Uh, this isn't a particularly earthquake prone area. So, um, you know, I don't think it's a particular concern that way. The, the natural fractures in the rock reflect the state of stress 200, 270 million years ago or so when the rock was really deeply buried. And the the ancient fractures don't necessarily reflect the current state of stress deep underground. Um, I, I hope that helps. I think so. Let's see. What surprised you the most in your study at Falling Water? <laughs> Any particular that's, thing that really blew you away? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I was surprised that no one had studied it before. I thought I would offer a, a GSA field trip there and I would just learn what people had learned in the past from, and from past trips and just add my own observations, but end up working from scratch. And then when I went there, the first time I was just in awe. The second time I went, I realized that the building stone is marine and I know where the quarry is. 
And there wasn't supposed to be a marine layer at that location, at that level in the rocks. So I started being very skeptical that it actually came from there. But after studying it and finding the natural exposures of the same rock, I'm 100% convinced now that all the building stone, except that one, uh, come from the quarry. And it, so that was a surprise. But there have been many, I mean, the joy of discovery here has been just great. And maybe something for young people who may be listening today or in the future, you don't necessarily have to go to outer Mongolia to find interesting uh, things and have the joy of discovery um, and find things that can help people understand and appreciate the land around them. Wonderful. Well, Fred, this was such an enlightening presentation. You've gotten so many, so many great comments in the Q and A about this wonderful blend of art and science. Even some comments from some uh, teachers that are excited about sharing this webinar with their students. So, thank you very much for giving us an entire new lens to look at falling water with. Yeah, and if people out there, if people out there have a stone right house, they would like a geologist volunteer to come study. Let me know. I love learning. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much, Fred, and thank you all for attending. Um, our next webinar will be in June on June 6th with photography Leslie Williamson. So we hope you'll tune in for the next webinar. Thank you, everyone.